Hi everyone, welcome to this Google Digital Garage session on digital marketing strategy. I'm Annie and I'm a trainer for the Google Digital Garage free skills program and I've been with this initiative for over six years now. I've also got a background in marketing for most of my career and also had an online business so I know the highs, the lows and everything in between as regards careers and businesses as regards digital marketing strategy. I'm not alone today. We're very fortunate to have Mohammed, who's also a digital coach, and he is joining us in the chat. Now, you will understand who he is both by his name, but also by the blue spanner that is right next to his name. Please feel free to interact with us. This is a time for you to ask any questions that you may have. Now, if you're having any problem in seeing or hearing us, often you can just press F2 or refresh, and that will iron out any difficulty for you. Now, to join in the chat, don't forget to sign up or sign in to YouTube. It'll take just a few seconds to do that and really make the most of this session. Now, this particular session is not a standalone one. We have so many at the Digital Garage, many of which or some of which are mentioned throughout this session today. And to find out more about that, you can go to g.co forward slash digital garage. And it's also underneath in the description below. There is one course that I'd really love to point out to you as regards digital marketing today, and that is the foundations of digital marketing. And this is a free certificate that is endorsed by the Open University as well as Google. And it's at the same link I've just pointed out to you. And it's well worth the time and investment. If you pass at the end, you'll get a certificate that you can print off as well. So please do go ahead and have a look at that. But for now, let's have a look at digital marketing strategy. Just a few hellos before we get started. So there's Dana from London. Hi, Dana. Thanks very much for joining us today. Or Dara, sorry. Karapan, hello from Canada. And I think we had another earlier from Canada as well. Um, Cynthia as well from sunny London. So again, we get so many locations, which is fantastic. And welcome and a warm welcome to all of you. So first of all, we're going to have a look at digital marketing strategy and what digital generally means in the online world for business. So we know digital from a personal standpoint, which is very, very useful as a starting point. But how does that reflect for us as businesses and how useful can that be? Then we're going to look at the main channels. So there's lots and lots of channels out there, but we're going to select one of the six of the key ones for us to look more in detail at together today. And then we're going to fish, finish off with a nice and simple plan that we can look at how to build um, both for the example on screen, but also you can start to consider how that might be useful for your own businesses as well. So without further ado, let's have a look what comes next. So First of all, I want to let you know about a free initiative, which is mentoring for small and medium sized businesses here in the UK and charities as well. So this is a free initiative, which is one to one with lots of experts that you can connect with. And you can sign up at g.co forward slash UK mentoring. And I'm sure Mohammed will be dropping in the link for you in the chat. There's a few more hellos. Cassidy, hello from Edmonton. Oh, another one from Canada. Hello. And Jero from Argentina. Fantastic. Oh, and Ismi from Dublin. Lots and lots of locations. Fantastic. Welcome all. So before we get started, as I mentioned, it's so great if we can get you interacting with us. It's good for you. It's good for your knowledge, for taking information in, but also for us to be able to support you with anything that you might have in terms of questions. So the first thing I really want to ask you is to think about what digital marketing can do for you. So the landscape has changed massively in the era of digital. Um, we went from having a TV that took 50 years to come about to the Internet coming in just a year. And the Internet has now been with us for quite some time. And it has fundamentally changed the way that people communicate with businesses. So this is what we're going to explore today. And as I mentioned, I love engagement. So one of the questions I'd love to share with you is what opportunities might you get from being online? So have a think about that, you know, thinking about your own businesses now, there's a bit of a delay with the information I get through from Mohammed at the back end. So do share your thoughts on this and I'll come to it. But think as a consumer, what kind of things do you get from having businesses in the digital space? And what could that mean as a business in terms of opportunities for you? 
Yes, Paula, reaching more people. Fantastic. That's a great answer. Absolutely. Because before we could only really reach the people that were in our local area, or at least within a shorter reach within the UK, for example, and um, being able to reach people outside your immediate location. Thank you, Ismi. Yes, absolutely. And yes, reach is a massive area that we want to consider when we're looking at opportunities in the digital space. And we'll cover off the different areas in a moment. But one of the reasons that digital is so useful to us is the way that it keeps people connected. Mobile has in particular changed the way that we act and we behave. I mean, now we carry around in our pockets our entire lives. If you think about the pandemic, how much we were using our devices and how it connected with so many things within our world. It helped us to find information at the touch of a button and still does. It helped us to socialize, to educate us. And we've never been more connected to information than ever before in history. So we're connected to knowledge, but we're also connected to people. So we can reach out to people in so many different ways through digital. And when we have mobile in our pocket, it makes it quite intimate. It makes us connected to those businesses, to those people that we can connect with digitally. And it's pretty much all the answers at our fingertips. People don't, or children don't tend to ask the parents as much as they get older, they'll Google it. So now the information is there and available to all. And it has the power, therefore, as consumers to do product research for us to be really sophisticated shoppers and to know really what the best price is, what the best offer is and what the best value is. So it gives a lot of power over to the users. And yes, reaching people is a big part of that. And as mentioned by, I think, is, is Mizzy? Um, sorry if I'm pronouncing these wonderful names wrong. But yes, it's about getting out of our immediate location. And now we can reach people globally. So we can expand from our original customer base to anywhere in the world. And this tool that you can see on screen at the moment is called Google Trends. So I'm sure Mohammed will kindly share that link in the chat for you. But Google Trends can show us by location what is most popular. So for example, if we're using a search term like running shoes, as shown on the screen, we can see if different countries have higher levels, which gives us opportunities we may never have known of before. And if we don't use these opportunities, the chances are our competitors will be. So we're now a global world and people are able to look globally for products and services over the internet. So we can expand our customer base as far and wide as we'd like. The other thing that the digital world now brings to us is insight into our customers. So whilst customers can find out information about products and services, which gives them an opportunity to be sophisticated shoppers, we can learn much, much more about our customers as individuals. So we can find out from tools such as shown on the screen, like the Google marketing platform behavior, the gender, the age. We can find out things like their likes, their dislikes, and it helps us to become far more relevant with the kind of marketing materials we make. And ultimately, like any relationship, if we, if we feel somebody is speaking to us directly, if we feel they understand us, we're far more attuned to what they're saying and we're more likely to trust them and to create a relationship, which essentially business is about. It's about building trust relationships and developing on something called value between both us and the business. In fact, many businesses now are considered by people as friends. They want to create that sort of intimate relationship. So it's about creating that understanding of what our customers are looking for. And as mentioned, communication is key to that. So where we used to push information out through the television screens, we're now able to have a two-way stream of communication through digital. So it makes it much easier for us to ask questions, to share our concerns, to share our interests online, but also to get that information back. Now, the important thing is reviews can be fantastic because they share, if you share good news about something you've brought, other people will probably like that as well. So we've discovered that a high number of people trust strangers and trust refer references and referrals and ideas from others and recommendations as much as they would or almost as much as they would a friend. So having that kind of power in giving those reviews 
is really key for businesses. So if they get those reviews, it shows that they're a good, trustworthy company. And it also shows what the company does as well. So when people leave reviews that are good about our business, it helps to sell our business to other people. Now, in the days before digital, word of mouth used to spread from one person to maybe 20. But with electronic world of mouth, we could go so much further. And everything that we put online about a business has the power to make it more useful to other users and also more effective for the businesses. So it also helps us as consumers to discover what businesses we can trust, which ones we might like and what those businesses do well. Because if we feel that those businesses are responding, we know that they'll respond to us as users. So it gives us trust. So if we think about how we want to be communicated with online, that will help us in how we communicate with our customers, too, because if we treat our customers well, then that will help spread a good message about our business. So it's very much about thinking about what is publicly put online. So we need to respond if it's negative and we need to respond if it's positive. Now, we've got another session on writing for social media where we go into that a little bit more in depth. So please do go to g.co forward slash digital garage for that. So let's just see if we've got any questions. It looks like we haven't so far. And Mohammed's doing a brilliant job there in the chat. I do have something from Cynthia. Is there a link to learn about customers? So customers is where we sort of gather as individuals, as businesses, how our customers work over time. So as smaller businesses, the best intel is that from learning from our competitors, but also from our customers directly. So asking our customers questions, that's another thing that the digital world can do for us. We can do that via email, via social media and lots of different ways but also through all the analytic reports. And some of that we're going to cover today, Cynthia. I hope that helps. So now we're going to look more at the channels. And I mentioned that there's many out there now and it's growing all the time. So how digital is going is at the speed of knots, which is meaning that we need to focus on the ones that are most useful to us at the moment. So as it picks up speed and those new channels are coming, they're becoming more available, but it's important really to get to grips with the most established ones, which are the ones that we're going to cover off with you now. So here's some that you may or may not have come across, but these are the ones that we'd probably say to focus on as the most important to begin with. So SEO, also known as search engine optimization, is where we can get found in the search engines through optimizing our efforts in the web um, in the web pages. So we actually get um, recognized for each individual web page, not an entire website. Each individual web page has its own value. But we're going to go through SEO in a bit more depth a bit later on. Also, search engine marketing. So sometimes you'll see an advert come up in the search engines and that is search engine marketing. So that's where we pay to actually appear in the search engines. Social media marketing. So this is a more recent form of marketing, but this is where we can use information through all the funnel to attract people. So the funnel being we need to create awareness with our customers. We need to get them to learn about us, to engage, to shop from us and then to come back to us again, to be loyal to us. So that funnel can be all affected by social media. And we'll look into that as well. Display marketing. So this is where you might see banners turning up in different formats or videos across the Internet. Email marketing. So we might think it's dead, but it's not. It's still very popular and you might receive emails even more now that you're on a mobile and a handheld device. And content marketing. So this is where we have different kinds of content to attract value um, with our customers and make them engaged. So now we're going to get started with search marketing. So really, search marketing at its simplest is really just about the power of search to reach new customers. And we've had so many of you mentioning the importance of reach and reach is key, isn't it? Because in, until we're found, we can't really engage or get them to learn about us, shop or become customers who come back. So. Getting to reach customers is one of the things that the search engines do, as so many of us use search engines regularly. And this that you can see on the screen is something called a SERP, otherwise known as a search engine results page. 
and it's categorized by three main points, really. And the first is the search query. So this is what we type in when we're looking for something. And they can be quite short and they can be quite long. We're asking more and more questions to the web. But the search query is the first thing that we tend to put into our search. The next thing along is the ad paid ads. So paid advertising comes right up. You'll see it on your mobile. You'll see it on your desktop in the box right below the search query. So right at the top. And that helps to give attention to those products and services that we're selling as small businesses. And as we're growing, it's a nice way to get visible on the search engines until we get more known. And as we become more known and more experienced, we can start to appear in the organic search listings, which is coming right below the ads. And so after the ads, which are about three or four places, underneath that, you'll see the organic search. And that is the search engine results page that we all land on when we're looking in the search engines. So to get started with search engine optimization, the first thing we need to do is look at how we can make it relevant for the people that are searching. So there's a fantastic free tool called Google Search Console. Now, Google Search Console, it really reads your website in a way that is technical and shows you any of the problems that might be happening. So it's the technical side of what's happening on your website. And it helps to see also how you rank on Google. So it will show you how well you're ranking. And the great thing about it is if there are any errors, it will show us. So you as a user, as a consumer, might have come across websites where there's a broken page, a 404 error, we call it, or something not working. And as a user, that might put you off ever going back to that website again, or certainly you wouldn't try to use that link again. So thinking about that and using the search console to help us understand which pages are broken will help us in improving our search engine results. It will also help because it's supporting the consumer, the user who's looking. Next, you need to think about submitting a sitemap. Now, a sitemap is essentially giving the Google bots, so these are little spiders that crawl the web and try and find the pages that exist on the web and categorize them. So it's helping the Google bots to understand the structure of your website. So I don't know if you've ever been to a theme park or to a big event where there's lots of different places that you could go to and you might get lost. Now, if they're not labeled correctly, you might not end up at the correct seminar. You might not end up in the right room or on the right route if you're driving a car. So the map is really important in helping Google to understand what your page is about and how they connect to each other and how they work together as a map. So Google better knows how those things link together and it means they can help the right people go to the right pages because Google exists to help make access to information much more easily, readily available and relevant to the users. So having that in mind helps us consider the users much more when we're creating our content so that it's user friendly and valuable and easy to find. The next thing to think about is that valuable content. Again, it's about making it user friendly. So if somebody's typing in a search query, they'll want that search query to come up in the title of the page that they land on. And they'll want that page to be relevant to what they've just typed in. So thinking about good titles, thinking about also writing snippets. So you might see in the search engine results page that underneath the title, there's a little bit of an introduction to that page. Now, that's where the snippet goes. So it's important to write your descriptions of the page, otherwise known as meta descriptions, so that when people do search in the search engines, they'll know what that page is about when they land. And also using the correct heading tags so that people know what they're looking for. So once we get started, there are some tips for success, some key areas, really, that make your website's visibility much better so that people that are searching for products and services like yours can find them. One is looking at keyword research. So this is really discovering what kind of words and phrases people are using to find your services and products. And if you're just starting out, a good thing to do is to ask your customers what kind of things they search for or listening to what your customers are saying. But some great tools to find out about keyword 
research and how much search is looking around those particular terms is the Google Keyword Planner. And you can find that on the Google Ads site. And that's free of charge to use. There's other sites such as Ubersuggest or Keywords Everywhere. And all of these help you to find your keywords that will tell you the kind of volume that people are looking for in terms of those keywords. So getting that keyword research in place is really good effort and really useful to do from the beginning. Then it's about making useful content. So finding the content that people are going to be interested in and helping search engines as well to better understand the kind of content that you're creating, the services you offer and the products you offer. So it helps people to understand what you're doing, but it also brings value to the users as well. So that content has to give some reference to how it's useful to the individuals. So understanding your customer helps with this as well. And then making those web pages search engine friendly. So as mentioned, the title's important, the description's important, and even the visuals that you use are important so that people know that they've landed in the right place and you're more likely to keep them interested. What you don't want to do, though, is something called keyword stuffing, where you just put keywords all over your page because it's what someone's looking for. It needs to read naturally because actually stuffing will go against you in terms of the user interest. The main thing you need to focus on is getting people to your page, but keeping them engaged when they arrive there. And that will help you to iron out what's important. Now, customers are searching more and more locally than ever before, probably because of the rise of the mobile devices. And these are some of the aspects on screen that people will use as something that many call local SEO or search engine optimization. A high number search every day for local because of that. So it's worth investing in these different channels if you do have a local business. The first you can see there is Google Business Profile, or used to be known as Google My Business. And we actually have a session called Getting Visible with Google that you might want to sign up for, which will help you set that up and make it really effective. Bing, because there's other search engines out there, you can use their tools. TripAdvisor, if you're in the hospitality or the entertainment industry, and Yell is like the yellow pages online, a directory. So we used to get those big books coming through the door. Now it's moved more digitally. So we can upload our information to those online directories so that people know where we are locally. So all of these are useful things as customers and therefore will be useful as businesses too, because if customers are looking there, then that means we've got an opportunity to capture them while they're on their journey. So this is the Google profile that we were just speaking about. And what you want to remember to do is to keep it as descriptive as possible. And one simple error that seems to happen quite a lot or particularly did in the pandemic was not putting the opening and closing times correctly. So imagine as a user, if you traveled somewhere and it was actually closed whilst it was marked as open, that would be a disappointing experience as a user. So always remember to keep your details updated. The other things you want to add to that is bringing it to life. If it is a cafe, for example, you might want to show interior and exterior photos. There's something called 360 Street View, and you'll be able to do it very low charge. It, in fact, it's free of cost, but it's not the highest quality, but it will give an image if you're just starting out of the inside and the outside of your property. Or you might want to, for example, include photos of your team and let them know who you are, what you're about, so that people feel more familiar. Again, it's about creating that communication aspect and connecting with people. Because although businesses are behind a screen, they're still people, they're still actual real businesses, real people who want to communicate with you and you want to communicate with consumers. So having that relationship is key. And those photos will help. So the things to look at now, the final area of this part, is to look at search engine optimization versus search engine marketing. So there is a little bit of a difference, obviously, between the two, and we're going to look at those now. Now, the first thing that they have in common is obviously they appear in search engine results pages. But SEO is free. So essentially, over time, as you get better known to the search engines, to your customers, as they have great experiences with you, as you start to learn how to get found better with valuable content and well-made structured pages, of course, your search engine optimization will start to improve. 
And when you're just starting out, it's great to have that advertising as well so that people can find you more visibly in the search engines because there's a lot of businesses out there. But what they have in common is they both really do rely on keywords to find out a lot of information. So, for example, if we start with the paid advertising, we can find out what keywords are useful to our users, to our customers. And we can then use those in our organic search as well over time. But you do pay for search engine marketing, whereas over time, SEO, obviously, that is free and it's free from the start. And if you're lucky enough to appear straight away, that's fantastic. But generally speaking, it can take a bit of time. So, for example, if you put in just the term pizza, it might take months. But if you put pizza takeaway Birmingham, it might be a, a matter of weeks or days. So it can be variable, of course, but getting those search engine listings up there is Something that takes time and a bit of effort, but is worth putting together in terms of the value for your customers. And when you're doing search engine marketing, you bid on keywords. So essentially, you put a price on the keyword, which is suggested through the auction. And then you auction against other people that want to bid on the same keyword, other businesses, to try and get found. Whereas when you use search engine optimization, you just find out the keywords that work best and you optimize them. You use them in the correct place, places on your pages, the content correctly, you use it in the visuals and you optimize your website based on what your users need and value. And so, as mentioned, it can take time to build with SEO, but with SEM, it can happen quite quickly because you're paying to get found. So to get started with search engine marketing, then this is where we first start up a Google Ads account. So I think Mohammed might share a link with you as to how you can sign up to that. And you start with a campaign. Now, if you sell lots and lots of products, campaigns are such useful things because what they do is they keep your product theme tight and they help make it organized around what you're trying to promote. So for example, if you're selling women's shoes, and men's boots, you're going to want two different campaigns so that you can focus more carefully on each of those groups as separate entities. Both of those will attract different keywords and both of those will require different focus. You will then need to think about your targeting options. So depending on where you're selling to, you might want to think about a particular location, a city or even a postcode initially, because it can be really attractive to think about going global straight away. But it's good to test a small area and gradually build from there and see where your customers are and how to get the best attrition from them. Then you might want to think about times of day. So if, for example, you do sell pizzas and you have a pizza takeaway, you might sell them just in Birmingham. So you might want to limit your search or your adverts just to that area of Birmingham, but also to times of day. So people get hungry in the evenings, particularly for pizza. So you might not want to advertise pizza at 9 a.m. in the morning, for example. So by reducing it right down to the location and the times of days, you're better managing your budget. And you can set your own budget and you can allocate the amount that you think is appropriate and that you can afford as low as you know is needed for that particular advert so you'll be given the opportunity to start low and to play with that budget and see what works for you then it's about optimizing that all important keyword list so not all keywords are provided equally and you'll probably find that if you're selling pizzas in birmingham you're going to want to put pizza birmingham takeaway not just pizza because pizza might attract from all areas of the country, for example. And if you're a pizza restaurant and you're, you, know, you don't offer takeaway, that's important as well. Are you a takeaway? Are you a restaurant? So think about the keywords that you're going to use that reflect your business. And then think about how you can tightly manage that campaign. So we talked about women's shoes, men's boots. Are there ways that we can manage our campaigns around each product or service carefully? And is anyone familiar with ad extensions? So ad extensions are a great way for us to get more visibility in the search engine results pages. So we can add different things such as a call now button. So you might see when you're on mobile and you see an advert for a pizza, it will have a call number button and you can go straight through to the number. So this just improves that what we call click through rate. And it also can add value to your advert as well. So if you've got a special offer, you can put that in as well. 
It's also really important to connect your Google Analytics because you might think your ad's not working brilliantly, but you need to see the whole customer journey and where they land on your website and what they do because it might be an opportunity to bring them back. And some people, depending on what you sell, might visit a few times before purchase. So having Google Analytics installed will tell you how effective your pages are and what's working well for you and where you might want to improve. So now we're going to look at display marketing. So responsive ads are where display marketing lives. So this is where we use machine learning and it can help to create relevant ads that can literally fit anywhere across the web. So ads can now feature with a logo and that can add to brand awareness. So the great thing about using our, um, our response ads and our display marketing is that we get great brand awareness. And I mentioned about a funnel earlier on and about brand awareness being important. It's actually a big part of our time and budget as business owners that we're going to spend on awareness and brand awareness. So that's where display marketing can help us. There's also now rounded call to action buttons that we can use within those. So that's adding value as well. So it's not just awareness, it's an opportunity for people to engage too. So what are display ads? So as mentioned, they are machine learning led and they are created at different places across the web. So you might have seen um, news blogs such as The Guardian or The Telegraph and see adverts on there. You might visit particular um, interest sites like Mumsnet. And for example, if you are a company that sells children's toys, you might want to attract people in their space. So a great place to do that is within our display marketing, because within there, people will be already visiting Mumsnet, for example. And if they offer ads on Mumsnet, you can then put your ads on there as well. So people that already visit that place that are mums, that are your target audience, will see your advert and they're more likely to trust it. So this is an opportunity to use display ads effectively. And with that increased call to action button, it really adds value to the experience because people can then click through and come to your website as well. And what's brilliant about display ads is the sheer creativity of us, because we all have so many different ways that we engage and learn and take information in. Some of us like video content, some of us like visuals, because visuals tell a thousand words, and some of us like text ads. And we have the opportunity to create all those different types when we're using display ads, right in the places where our target audiences may already be visiting. So it can be effective if you want to extend your reach. And we're talking about reach right from the beginning. And if you know exactly who your target market is, then display marketing is very useful indeed. So how can we get started? In a similar way, we'd sign in to the Google account like we would for the Google Ads campaign. But this time we would use the display function. So this is where we can, for example, if we're a shoe seller, I mentioned shoes a few times, I might have that campaign for boots and I might have it for shoes and I might have it for Wellingtons. So then we can start to create ads that are attuned to that, that are visually appealing to those particular products, to those particular people. And then what we can do is we can make it really specific. Again, we can really tighten it down to location, also to the kinds of people. So what's really brilliant about display is we can really target those individuals based on demographics, based on their interests and their topics, as mentioned with Mumsnet. So if we've got parents looking for children's toys, we'll be able to really drill down, for example, on those blogs of interest where people will be hanging out, parent blogs, mum blogs, etc. So this is where display advertising is really useful because we can put it into a context. It was, in fact, historically called context based advertising, but now it's called display. But it does still fit in that context. And as mentioned, you can be really creative and eye capturing. And that's what really stays with you as a user. You want something to stand out in this really busy um, world that we're now in in the digital space. So creating something that really is eye capturing and has something really compelling and a call to action button is useful. So call to action is asking the customer to do this. So something like buy now, call now, visit our store. So telling the customer what to do will really help them to take action because often we do things without thinking and we want people to tell us how to think. And that's very true of the digital world. 
So the top tips for success when it comes to display is, first of all, understanding your customers. So by understanding our customers, it's a really good starting point. And we need to really get to grips with who they are. We do a bit more about understanding our customers, again, in writing for social media and in social media strategy. So have a look at those when you have a moment. But display ads, they come in different sizes. So you can find different ways of engaging with your audience and see which ones work best for you. And you have two options. You can either do what we call a cost per click bidding or a cost per mill. So if you want to get people to click on an ad, then cost per click is great. But if you want to show to as many people as possible to fill up that brand awareness at the top, then cost per mill bidding is probably the way forward for you. Also, what's great is if somebody comes to your website or if someone shows interest and they disappear again, it shows that they initially had a keen interest in you and wanted to know a bit about you and perhaps maybe didn't have time or needed a bit more information. With retargeting, you can go back to those people that have already visited and bring back them back to your site with an offer. You could give them a discount code, for example, and you can retarget them based on what they've already seen and what they've shown an interest in. So it makes it really useful as a business owner to do that. And then there's different ad, ad formats that we can test and we can optimize. So we might find that banner ads work well or maybe video ads work better. And so by trying different ones out with different um, sites and different target audiences, we'll learn more about what is most effective for us as a business. So the next thing to consider is social media marketing. Now, I bet most of you are on social media and that's exactly why as a business you would want to be on there too. We actually have a session on social media strategy that you might want to attend and writing for social media. And both of those take you through the journey of why social media is important and how to attract and engage your audiences. But social media is where a lot of people now spend their time online. A huge amount of time, in fact, is spent there. You might have found in the pandemic in particular, you've used it an awful lot. And it's actually really a sociable world for them. So getting involved in that mindset and understanding what the users are on there for will help you, as well as thinking about the platforms that your users actually attend and spend time on. So a great way to actually feed that funnel that we mentioned about brand awareness right the way through learning about different products and services, engaging with you, shopping with you and becoming customers and staying with you is through social media. So you can help reach new customers, nurture existing ones and turn them into advocates so that they tell other people about you. We talked about the importance of trust and sharing information and letting people know what you do through electronic word of mouth. So doing this and getting people to know more about your services and, and the value it brings will be all important for you um, as you're spreading and developing your business. So social media can help grow your business in so many ways, as mentioned, with that funnel of people coming through. And one great thing is it can generate more sales because over 85% of people in the UK are on some form of social media. And I bet you're on them as well. So it makes a good opportunity for connecting with new customers. We can reach new audiences on there. We can get business opportunities. We can reach out and make those relationships that we might have made in the real world through social media. We can also highly target people based on so much about them that we didn't have before. Because, again, we've got that insight now that digital is giving us all that information. And building those all important relationships and networks. So it's just as important to build relationships online as it is offline. So building up those networks is important. And we can do that through social media. Also, improving your marketing in general. So you might have seen hashtag whatever word come up in the search engines. And that's because social media is working to improve your social media, uh, your search results as well. So it helps you get noticed on search. It attracts more people to your site. So it can really help bring people through to your website. And it helps gaining that all important customer feedback and insights. Because the more we know about the customers, the more we can service them correctly. In days gone by, we might not realize what kind of things our customers like or are interested with in terms of large numbers. And now we can 
And we can customize our information and our content and our products and services to those particular customers. So the rich information that's out there is really valuable in the digital age. Also, more than ever, social media helps us to keep an eye on our competitors. And often we might get lost in what we're doing, but it's so important to look at what our competitors do, because by doing that, we can see what they might do next, what works well, what works badly, and it will give us a real insight into how to improve our business. So do keep an eye on your competitors as well. So social media, a bit like search, has two forms of being seen. And one is organic, so you don't have to pay. Essentially, it's free. Although, remember, it's not entirely free because you still need the resources, you still need the time, and you need the content that you need to create to get it out there. So it's not completely free, but certainly you can do that on a budget that you decide. And if you only leave it to organic, you won't show to as many people. It will be just to those immediately in your reach, such as the friends you already have. And it also depends how well engaged they are already with your content as to how much they see. You might realize that you don't see too much content from all the businesses you follow, and you might have liked lots of pages. And that's because some you've engaged with better than others. And remember, the key is all about that communication and that two way flow and keeping them interested. And that's what will create better organic uh, results for you in the social media as well as in the search and paid social media as well. So this is where we can pay and we can get seen by more people. And what's brilliant about paid social media is we can choose exactly who to target. So we can reach, say, for example, an age group, a gender, a location. And if we've got a product or service that matches that kind of interest, we can make it very focused towards those people. So there's different ways that we can use social media to best effect. So how can we get started? First of all, it is important to define who your target audience is. So the questions that you'd want to ask are, who are they? You know, um, are they male? Are they female? Are they a particular age group? Where do they live? Um, what are they into? You know, what are their likes, their dislikes? What are their interests? What or who influences them? Is there some celebrity that they follow? Is there a particular um, political force that they're after, that they're interested in? And when are they usually online? So finding out the time of day is a very useful thing as well, so that we can make sure that when we create that content, it's in their eyes and in their hands at the right time. And what social media do they use? So one of the key questions when we're doing social media is what platforms are they on? Because we might like a particular platform personally, but if we find out that our audience is not on that platform very much or they're much more on other platforms, then we might be missing out on an opportunity to engage with them. So we don't just want to be on all the popular platforms. We want to just be on the ones that our particular audience are on. We can define our audience by asking them questions directly. We could send emails, do a competition around getting that feedback, and we can do focus groups or ask our customers if we have a phone call center, for example. But there's lots of ways as well through looking at insights now through digital. So we can look at our page insights on social media to find out a lot of these answers as well. So it's important to choose our channels carefully and not to just select them all because they sound popular or not just because we're on them. And then post engaging content regularly. So you might have seen some sites that stop posting altogether and you might wonder, are they out of business? What are they, uh, you know, are they interested in what my, um, what I like, what I don't like? Are they wanting to engage with me? So do keep engaged with your customers and keep posting regularly and keep that fresh content coming through because that will make them feel that one you're a valid business you're in operation but also that you're adding value to their lives so do ask questions you could ask polls about what their interests are and that will keep them um, more likely to be engaged in your brand because just like any relationship, it has to be two ways. So asking questions to your audience, don't be afraid to do that. Get that information and show it's been used in some way to improve your product or service. And you're more likely to develop those all important advocates in the future that you'd really like for your business. So don't forget, a lot of these channels have their own analytics and you can look at those and see what is showing on those analytics as to a lot of the answers to these questions. And then drill down and create the content that is working best for you already. Do more of that. 
So some tips for success. So quite often in social media, we find that there's a spray and pray, which means you put your content out now and see what happens later and just put everything that you, you can think of out there really quickly. The better way is to think about a goal. So what do you want to achieve from this piece of content that you're putting out there or this particular platform that you're on? Some people use specific platforms for particular purposes. So they might have a mission for using Twitter as a customer service channel, for example. They might have a problem with customer service around the clock. So that might be a quicker way for them. Or they might use Facebook because of the automatic replies. So different goals for different businesses. And you have to think what is the most important goal for you? And why would social media add any value to you? What would you want to use it for? And then it's about understanding who your audience is again, going back to those questions we've already discussed and thinking about that target audience and how you can approach them and what their interests might be. And keep on those conversations, those two way things to find out how you can best engage them. And make sure that you do respond quickly. So in the writing for social media, we talk about setting um, social media guidelines. And it's a really useful thing to do if you agree that within a certain amount of time, you'll respond and the do's and don'ts of what you'll do in that space. And then you've got a document both for yourself and for any other person that might take on the role after you as well. So consider your audience in a bit of detail. And then remember that consistent and regular updates you know, what do they need to know about? What's new in your industry, your product or your service that you can let them know about? What other ways, what other new users or uses can you show in your videos or in your, your comments or in your, or your content, in your blog articles that you want to put on social media? Just keep active and keep engaged and that will certainly help with you being successful. So email marketing, I mentioned earlier, it's certainly not dead. It's very much more important than ever because First of all, you can get it on your phone, but also now it is led by permission. So we have to agree to any of the content that we have sent to us as users. Uh, so there's something called GDPR in the UK. That means there's a legislation around uh, content that we're receiving as emails and we have to agree to it before it arrives. So keeping that in mind, it means that when customers do get our content, it's going to more likely build loyalty with them because it's content they expect or that they would um, be happy to receive. And the great thing about email marketing is it's one to one. It's creating that intimate message with each of your customers, making them feel valued, heard, respected. And because now we can start to see what interests they have, we can make it really relevant to each of those users. And because they've agreed, they've given us their permission, it means that when we are sending that information, they're ready to receive it and they are prepared to, to look at it and to use it. So you're much more likely to get a good response from email marketing because you're already known to those individuals and they've already been willing to share their information with you. And they're happy, therefore, to hear about your products and services. So it's a great way to engage. So the first thing you need to consider is what kind of platforms right for you. There are so many email providers out there all offering different or some very similar features, but also different ones, too. Depending on what you need to deliver as a business will determine which one is best for you. So there's some free platforms. So for example, MailChimp has a free level until you get to a certain subscriber level. I believe it might be 2000, although don't quote me on that. It could have changed recently, but you can get up to a certain level before you pay. And that will give you an, a chance to get used to using the technology and engaging with your customers through email. And it also helps you to build a relevant list of contacts. So if you're collecting emails through, for example, um, your web pages or through events and you've got their permission, you can start to put them in different lists as to where you've collected that information or what their interests are or what they've brought from you before, for example. And then you can start to create products and services relevant to those users. And what's brilliant is you can start to create VIP experiences. So as customers, we like to feel that we're recognized and we're rewarded. And we do like rewards if we feel we've earned them. So we can offer VIP experiences as, for example, rewards to those users who have brought from us previously. 
and we might be able to personalize it to make it more useful. So bringing in their name or bringing in um, something of interest to that particular target demographic will be useful for your customers to have. So that is where email really does add value to us as consumers, but also as businesses. So what we need to first do is get that relevant list of contacts in those specific audiences set up for, for those different needs we've talked about, whether it be where they've signed up from or whether they bought from us before, if they're new customers or existing. And keep it short. Don't bombard them with too much in an email because people might be reading it on the run, on their phones. So we just want to keep it to one, one real key element and one call to action. So ask them to do one thing with that email. And then measure. So marketing is all about testing and trying again with what's worked well the first time. So we can measure the open rate, how many people have opened that email and how many people have clicked through and done something that you've asked them to do within the email. The other thing to mention is with emails, we need to see if people unsubscribe. So some people might unsubscribe, but if we're getting a high rate of people unsubscribing, say over 1% in any campaign, then we're going to have to maybe think about what content we've shared and if we're using the relevant content, but also if we're sending it not enough or too frequently to our customers. There's lots of testing and lots of trial and error when it comes to email. But once we get a recipe that works, it can be extremely successful for us. So the final area to look at is content marketing, and some people call it king. So content marketing is about delivering some consistent, valuable experiences to your customers wherever they find us and rewarding them with loyalty as we go. So it's about really selling ideas. It's about using storytelling to build relationships with customers. It's about really connecting with them on, in a non-salesy way, because as mentioned, relationships are the key to driving business in all aspects. So there's different forms of content marketing. And just like we looked at in terms of the display, we can use different content to engage people. So videos, um, videos are becoming more and more popular now. It's a way of really feeling the personality and the connection with another person behind a screen, because otherwise we can feel that it's all very similar. So the videos bring personality, bring life, motion, sound into effect. So great content through video can feel really compelling to use and also looking at blogs. Blogs are not dead. Some people say they are, but they're not. A lot of people like to read. And I mentioned that people like different learning styles. So reading and watching will be different kinds of customers. So and we also like different styles, even as individuals as well. So thinking about blogs and the content we can create for them there. Case studies. So if we're selling business to business, we might want to create some case studies for what works well in the past. And for example, guides. So if we're selling cars, we might want to show a guide as to how to look after the car. And that will give them tips and advice and will keep us top of mind, for example, to customers who might want to come back in the future. So content marketing is a really good way to tell a story, add value, engage our customers and keep them coming back. So getting started, the first thing again is understanding your audience. And if you attend the Writing for Social Media, you'll learn about making what we call a persona. And that's really illustrating what your target customer might be interested in, what they might um what their demographics might be, their age, where they hang out in terms of their um, location. So have a look at how you can create some persona profiles, because once you have in your head who you're writing and creating content for, it becomes much easier to create something of value. Also creating a customer journey map. So this is where we take customers on a journey through all their pain points when they're buying. So if you think as a customer and you're buying a car, it might be a number of visits before you actually decide that's it, I'm going to purchase the car. And it might initially start with an online review of what the best cars are for, for example, carbon emissions or for energy efficiency. And then you might go further to the models or the locations or the outlets where you can buy the cars. So thinking of that, answering the questions in advance and giving content around the sort of things your customers might be looking for is really useful to do in terms of content marketing. 
And finally, looking at how to generate business from content marketing. So again, if you're there offering advice on what fuel efficiencies are the best cars and you offer one of those models, that's going to attract sales because you're giving information that customers are looking for. You're not saying in there, I'm selling this car. You're just telling them about fuel efficiency. But you also do have those cars for sale as a side byproduct. And this kind of information makes us as customers more trusting of the information we're being given, as well as more interested in those companies that are offering it. So some final tips for success when it comes to content marketing. First of all, use content to facilitate the sales process, but not just talking about sales, but using it to facilitate it. So helping that process come forward by answering those questions and concerns in advance for customers as we go through the buying cycle. Using storytelling to engage the audience, so making it interesting to the audience and making sure you reach lots of people. So distribute that content on social media and elsewhere on the web and measure it. Make sure that it's doing what you want it to do and keeping that forever measured and see what's effective. Now, we've got a time to stop for questions, but in, in view of time, um, we don't have a lot of spare moments at the moment, but let's just see what we've got. Um, Rene, any optimal channels for the arts? For the arts, well, that's a very interesting question. I go for the visual channels in terms of social media. So Instagram, Pinterest, um, when it comes to search, that's just as important really for arts businesses. Um, and yes, advertising as well is still important for arts. So it's very similar. It's just looking more for the aesthetic side, I suppose, when it comes to arts. So you might want to use some display to show some of your artwork, for example. Um, Gerald, I have a question. Do you think artificial intelligence will modify how search engines work? And how can we optimize our content to make more relevant in the age of AI? Very good question. Thank you, Gerald, for that. So AI is forever updating. We're all in a school of learning when it comes to AI. It's moving very fast and very changeable all the time and giving us far more useful information as we go. So it will help to optimize content in the future, definitely. Um, and as mentioned, things like display already use machine learning to do that. So it's already in process. Um, but yes, it's probably going to become more and more valuable as users that when we go online, things are going to be more relevant thanks to AI. Will we get a copy of this webinar? No, Rene, but it's available for 24 hours as a recording. So you'll be able to find it there. Any more questions? Questions, I'm sure Mohammed will be happy to answer for you in the chat. So now in the last few minutes, we're just going to look very quickly at building a digital framework. So these are the six points. I'd probably take a quick shot of this, a screenshot, because this is an important thing that you might want to use as a plan. And it all begins with goals. Otherwise, without a goal, we're just throwing a dart into space and hoping for results. So we need to have a focus. And then we need to think about the budget and resources, because whilst we'd like to do everything, it needs to be based on what we can afford to do as businesses and who can be helping us to do it. The audience, again, as in all of this, it's about knowing who our audience is because it's going to cut out the waste. Marketing is about reducing costs and keeping it relevant by knowing who our audience is so that we can speak to them directly and get better results. Deciding the channels, again, the channels will depend on us as businesses in terms of budget, resources and audience. And then planning our activity so that we get that in ahead of advance and then keeping it smart. So these SMART goals are specific, so that's targeting a specific area of improvement, measurable so that we know whether it's worked or not, so a particular quantity, assignable so we know who's going to be doing it, realistic, so what can we realistically hope to achieve in that time? And it has to be time bound so that we know whether it's been achieved or not. So we're going to give a quick example here, and it's Max, who is a hairdresser, and his goals are to get more people through the door and also to, to let people know more about how his, that his business exists. So that's his goal. And there's different online objectives we might use to help facilitate that goal. Some might be to increase traffic to his website if he had one, to increase online sales, for example, if he had an online business, or to increase social media followings and likes if he has a social media page, and also to increase that reach and familiarity and awareness that we were talking about online. So what we need to think here is about the difference between a goal and an objective. So a goal might be that we want to let people know we exist, whereas 
An online objective might be we need to get the increase of reach and awareness. A goal may also be that we want to sell more products, whereas an online objective is to get those sales through the website, for example. Or we might want to get found by more people, but an online objective might be through our social media pages that we get likes and followers. And we might also want to get return customers. And online, that might be increasing traffic to a website if we do have one. So budget and resource is important. So in terms of Max, as the example, he doesn't have a website. It's too much of an investment right now for him to have one of those. So it's not essential necessarily that he has a website for him. He does know his audience. So he knows that for his hairdressing salon, they're females, they're local, and they're about 30 and above. And they have children and tend to work part time. So most of them he's discovered do use Facebook. So it's helpful for him to know that. The marketing channels, therefore, are that he can use, for example, online reach and awareness. And some of the channels he might use for that are display, social media or content marketing. If he's wanting website sales, which he may or may not, but if he is, it's search engine marketing, search engine optimization and email marketing. If he wants to get traffic to the website, it's exactly the same. It's search engine marketing, SEO and email marketing. Those are the best ways to encourage that. And to increase loyalty is social media, email and content. So to plan your activity, here's an example of your objectives. So he didn't have the resources to get a website. So instead, he's created a Google profile page. He's set up a Facebook page with all his reviews, which is great for, for Facebook and for um, hairdressing. And he's advertised. So that is what he did. And how did he measure it? First of all, he wanted to increase his online sales. So he wants to, for example, increase by 20% within the first 20, uh, three months. And then to increase brand awareness, he decided to use Facebook for him by growing his audience by 40%. So because he doesn't have a website, he decided that he's going to use Facebook in particular. So his goal was to reach people locally and get them through the door. He knows his audience. His channel is local SEO, so Google profile and Facebook. His activity is to get that visibility on Google and also to get customers and to get them coming back. So he wants, therefore, to get 50% new likes on Facebook and 20% of those people coming through from Facebook through the door. So that is his plan. So what might your plan be? Have a look again at these six steps and take it away with you. So unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but I do know Mohammed's been fantastic in answering those in the chat for you. And your next steps. So your next steps is try that mentoring if you've got any specific questions from today at g.co forward slash UK mentoring. And also do sign up to g.co slash digital garage for more seminars. I've mentioned writing for social media, social media strategy and many more. So do have a look and thank you ever so much for coming today. And we'll see you in a session again soon. Bye bye for now.